To keep yourself updated, subscribe to Indigo Learn and click the bell icon and download our app OneFin to start learning on the go. Hello everyone. So here we are today discussing something really important for the upcoming examination. That is the RTP for the May 23 examination. Okay, so here we are discussing the CA final audit RTP, which is for the May 23 exam. Now, I call this an important discussion because, first of all, it will give you an understanding of where you exactly stand in the preparation. Because till now, if you must have studied, it could have been chapter wise. If you have revised, it has been chapter wise. So RTP will give you an insight that when you take the entire syllabus together, will you be able to recollect everything? Are you able to retain everything? Okay, that is the way in which you'll be able to understand and evaluate yourself as well. Also, RTP gives you an understanding of how the examination questions would look like. Also, the way in which you're required to solve them, that is to write the answers. So the interpretation, what is the exact requirement? All of this will be given to you as an indication through this RTP. So this particular discussion that we are going to have is going to give you an exposure to many things which become really, really important for the exam point of view. Okay, so when you take the May examination RTP, you will see that RTP is divided into two parts. The first part will be talking about the amendments and the next will be the questions that we are going to take up for discussion. Because there are many amendments this time in the audit RTP that is for the final, we'll have a separate video altogether, which is going to cover all the comprehensive discussion about the amendments that are there. All right. Obviously, a few of them have been already been discussed in the RTP November 22 examination. So it is a strong recommendation, highly recommended to every student. Okay, that whenever you are doing the RTP for the May examination, see that you along with that also check the RTP discussion that we had for the November examination, because there are certain amendments which have been picked up directly from there and bought it here. So it is very, very important that you go through both the RTPs together. Only then it is going to be a complete coverage of your understanding. All right. So with this, let us get started with the discussion of the questions that we have. So we begin first with the MCQs that are there. Then there are general MCQs. And then first we have the case study based MCQs. Then we'll be having the general MCQs. And then finally, there is going to be the descriptive questions. One important point again here is that in audit, it is very important for you to read the question with patience. Because ultimately, you have to understand what the examiner or what the question is actually asking you to write. Usually, the questions, the case which is given there, the case study, the scenario that they create looks so complicated that you get carried away and you realize that this is something we could not understand. But when you look at the last part of the question, you will realize that this is something actually very easy to answer and you have done it. So never get carried away with the question. Just don't start reading the question in a way that it is so complicated. What are they asking? Because always the examination questions are drafted in a manner which has so much of detail that for the end answer, some of the parts of it will be irrelevant. So read the questions with patience. Do not get carried away with the extra details that have been given. Read it with patience. Come to the last line and understand exactly what is the requirement. Sometime you will have a case study, but the question is going to be straightforward. All right. So it becomes very, very important that when you read the question, the understanding and the interpretation of the question is very important because in order to understand for which question, what answer has to be written is the real challenge. And if you go through that thing and if you're able to overcome that, then I think you'll be able to manage the paper actually really well. OK, so with this, let us get started with the discussion first with the case studies based MCQs, then general and then the descriptive questions. All right. So let us get started. All right. So as I told you, the RTP, if you look at the May 23 examination, so the first thing is the entire discussion regarding the amendments. So in the first one, we see that there's a company audit amendment for small companies. Okay, so two, uh, clause 85 has been amended with increasing the paid up and the turnover limits. Okay, so we'll take up all of this discussion separately. We'll have a separate uh, understanding of all the amendments that are there. But when you look at the chapter seven amendments, that is the regulation 17 and the 18, which have been covered here, these all have already been discussed in the RTP of November 22 examination. So basically it is the same amendment that has been copied and pasted from the previous RTP and this RTP. All right. Usually this is done because the Institute study material doesn't get updated. So until it is updated there, it will continuously appear in your RTPs. Okay. All right. Then, so the remaining part, when we take a separate discussion, we'll be covering all of it together. All right. Now, let us first take up the questions. So we'll pick up with the MCQs. So all of this is basically the discussion of all the amendments. And we can see there are good number of amendments which have been covered here. Okay. 
so there is nbfc uh, uh, with the where layers have been changed the classification of nbfcs have been changed then about peer review we have a detailed uh, discussion because a lot of things have been changed with where it becomes mandatory everything okay so i'll pick up the questions directly all right so let us get started with the questions and answers okay so first is the multiple choice question and that is the case study scenario all right so let us have a reading of this it is talking about nbfc and in nbfc there is an amendment okay so obviously it becomes an important discussion for us now so it is talking about nbfc so it says good deposit limited is an nbfc registered with rbi under section 45 ia of the rbi act and is listed on the national stock exchange it appointed abc and company chartered accountants as the statutory auditor for the financial year ending 31st march 2023 Mr J the audit partner of ABC and company extracted the monthly net owned fund position from the books of goods deposit limited ABC and company was peer reviewed last in january 2019 and its peer review certificate was valid until january 2022 okay ABC and company did not pay apply to the peer review after january 2022 till the date of the acceptance of the audit okay further it says they have given you net owned funds as calculated and monthly position has been given to you the board of goods deposit limited consisted nine directors of which five were non executive including a woman director and two were independent so they have given you the structure of the board here out of the above the chairperson of the board was a regular non executive director and a promoter of the company so he is associated with the promoters related there okay the company was not out of the 1000 top listed entities for the past 5 years so here this becomes an important discussion for us because they're talking something about the chairperson based on that we have an understanding of how the formation of the board should be there then during the year mr j recommended to the board and the audit committee to have internal auditors okay however the board citing budget issues rejected the audit partners recommendation board however assured that they would consider next year to have the internal audit department within the company all right so they have given all these things regarding the case study all right now let us take up the questions what is the question asking you mr j reported under clause 3a3 of the master direction that is nbfc auditors report reserve bank direction 2016 that good deposit limited is not eligible to hold its certificate of registration under section 45 ia of the rbi act and during the year the net owned funds went below the minimum requirement but the management of nbfc are of the different opinion they are requiring the certificate uh, pertaining to net owned funds from the statutory auditor okay with reference to the position as at the end of the financial year okay so your guide mr j with respect to the requirement under the master direction so this thing you study directly as a part of the audit of nbfcs where we know that uh, there is a requirement for you to obtain the certificate from the statutory auditors and this certificate is with respect to the position which is there at the year end so it is not depending upon the monthly position you take it for the yearly okay so here if you look at it this the options are every nbfc shall submit a certificate from its statutory auditor that it is eligible to hold a certificate of registration under section 45 iwa of the rbi act and such certificate should be with reference to the position of the company as end of the each financial year, at the end of the financial year correct okay so the answer will be obviously a because you require this kind of position or this kind of certificate for at the end of the financial year so if you look at all the other options definitely there is going to be something wrong in it where they would say each month and all or sometimes they could say not required so no the answer here would be you look into the position taking as the year together okay so the company will take the the management's contention here will be correct because they'll take the certificate from the statutory auditors which will be with respect to the position at the end of the year okay then moving to the next one mr j was of the opinion that the composition of the company's board of directors is not in compliance with the sebi listing that is lodr regulations 2015 kindly guide the management with respect to the provision which is not complied by the management specified in regulation 17 okay so here they are talking about regulation 17 where you are going to talk about the composition of the board here here you have to understand that they have spoken about something this which says non executive okay regular chairman is there okay so regular non executive chairman and he is also a promoter so he is associated with the promoter so there we know what is the composition requirement that 50% of them have to be independent okay so that is very important so here you have to pick up where the regular non executive chairperson is a promoter of the listed entity yes it is listed on the national stock exchange 
or is related to any promoter or person occupying management position at a level of the board of directors or at one below the board of directors at least half of the board of the listed entity shall consist of independent directors so first option itself is correct okay so you are very clearly they are telling it is listed it's a non executive chairman he is a promoter okay so your obviously it has to be what at least half of the bod of the listed entity shall consist of independent directors okay all right then moving to the next one at the time of accepting the audit of good deposit limited the quality engagement partner objected that abc and company does not hold a peer review certificate and hence cannot accept the statutory audit of nbfc mr j was of the opinion that abc and company is falling under the level 2 category and hence they are required to get themselves peer reviewed once in 4 years kindly guide mr j with respect to this now for this you need to understand that obviously when it comes to peer review there has been an amendment and now you don't have the classification of level 1 and level 2 okay so you are you have to look into the category of the uh, peer review so here it is basically a listed entity and for listed entity it is mandatory okay that they have to get the peer review done every time at the beginning and the end of the audit okay and it is applicable from 1st of april 2022 so here let us see what is it telling so let us pick up first april where the thing is coming okay so as per the peer review mandate which is an amendment okay as per the peer review mandate practice units which propose to undertake statutory audits of enterprise whose equity or debt securities are listed in india or abroad as defined by sebi lodr regulations for these practice unit there is a prerequisite starting from 1st april 2022 having peer review certificate before undertaking statutory audit engagement okay so it is obviously if you are doing the audit of the listed entity then it is becoming very important that the practice unit that is the firm is required to obtain the peer review certificate compulsorily and this mandate is applicable from 1st of april 2022 so every year when you take up the audit of the listed entities this kind of certificate becomes very important okay so this is an amendment again becomes very important for the examination point of view okay so you don't have the level 1 level 2 category anymore then moving on to the next one Mr J wants to highlight the matter with respect to the absence of the internal audit function in his audit report under the emphasis of matter paragraph okay however the management was of the view that the audit partner was not right by disclosing the said matter in his audit report as it was an internal audit matter and the audit team has not identified any material evidence which could impact the opinion of the auditor kindly guide Mr J whether proposed reporting under emphasis of matter paragraph in the audit report is correct or not Now, first of all, for this you need to have a proper understanding of SC seven zero six, which talks about EOM paragraph. That you should understand that in the EOM paragraph, you will be writing only about those matters which are already existing in the financial statement, the disclosure which is appropriately given in the financial statement, and which the auditor feels is very important for the users to understand. You never intend to give a modified opinion because of that particular matter, but it is important for the people to understand, for the users to understand that you put in the EOM paragraph. now you are that telling this absence of internal audit function okay now this is not something that you are going to write because first of all it is not something which is there in the financial statement not something that is required to be disclosed in the financial statement so in the audit report will you bring it in the eom paragraph the answer is no so let us pick up your so hence reporting in eom is correct this will be rejected up front eom paragraph included in the audit report refers to the matter other than those presented in the financial statement wrong because that is other matter paragraph look at the c option EOM paragraph included in the auditor's report refers to matters appropriately presented or disclosed in the financial statements correct and in the auditor's judgment are fundamental to the user's understanding hence reporting under EOM is incorrect so the answer here definitely is C okay so very clearly the answer will be C first of all they have given the correct meaning of the word EOM and they say the auditor cannot report this matter in EOM so it is incorrect okay so the answer will be C moving on to the next one kindly guide mr j regarding areas where he may need to report the absence of internal audit function now for this you need to get an understanding about the internal audit function it is a company it is a listed entity so obviously your caro is going to become applicable so you should remember properly which clause of the caro okay in caro do they allow you to give the reporting of internal audit function so obviously it is the clause 14 where you talk about this kind of deficiency so they say If you look at the first basis for qualification, no, we don't qualify this year. The auditor is required to report the same under clause eighteen. No, okay. So it is telling you it is going to report the same under clause fourteen of the Caro's auditor's report. So the answer will be C. Okay. So a very a simple question it was regarding uh, everything regarding NBFC's reporting. 
So first they have spoken about uh, the report that you require or the certificate that you require from the statutory auditors. Then it is talking about whether, uh, you know, reporting uh, when it comes to uh, NBFC, how is the reporting to be done? Okay, that has been clearly given. Then peer review, whether it is correctly done by them or not, uh, understanding of that. Then whether internal audit, whatever discussion we have done, okay, whether it has to be reported in the auditor's report under EOM. And finally, it is talking about where it has to actually come then, if not in the EOM. All right. And also they're talking about the composition of the board because they've given some kind of description regarding the chairperson's holding. So based on that, you need to understand what are the regulations. Okay. So the question is focusing properly on the NBFC requirements here. Okay. And obviously the board of directors composition and everything. All right. Now, independent MCQs, I've, I've seen it. It's a lot, not very complicated. You can actually crack it quite well if the preparation is up to the mark. Okay. Now, Mr. D is a practicing chartered accountant from Mangalore. He has been practicing as a sole proprietor from past two decades. Mr. D is a daughter. Miss S is newly qualified chartered accountant who cleared the final exam just three months ago. Immediately after qualifying, she wanted to set up a sole proprietorship concern and practice on her own. After setting up the form, she printed her own visiting card. So her visiting card looks like this. SN Company Chartered Accountant. Fine. Then they say proprietorship. That is, she gave her name. Oh, but she's writing here FCA. Okay. So FCA, obviously she's what? ACA. So if you're not a fellow and you're representing yourself to be a fellow chartered accountant, then in that case, you will definitely be guilty of professional misconduct. So this is going to be what? Part one of the, sorry, part three of the first schedule. All right. So there you talk about the CAs generally, the misconducts. So there it is. All right. So let us see which option you pick up here. Yeah. Obviously it is the D1 where they talk about, see, if you look at the uh, elimination part also, first of all, won't guilty wrong. Okay. Second, clause seven, there is nothing called as a designation which has been used wrong. She can use a miss X. S is correct. Become can be given no problem. Okay. Other misconduct. It is a part three of the second schedule. Other misconduct. Absolutely not. It cannot come. Then yes, Miss S will be guilty of professional misconduct as per clause one. Okay. Of the part three of the first schedule. Okay. So the answer is D. Where you are not a fellow, but you are representing yourself to be a fellow chartered accountant. Okay. Then. Moving to the next one, Mrs. A D I Associates, a statutory auditors of Prakash Limited for the financial year 22-23. While conducting the audit, C S R of the engagement partner noticed the following: payment to various government employees not supported by any document. Notices received from various regulatory authorities. Notice received means something irregularity is there of non-compliance is there. Payment of various fines and penalties again non-compliance. Heavy pay payments to legal counsel again legally have done something wrong. Unusual cash payments. So all their indicators of what? Okay. So CSRF should consider the above indicator of what? Doubt of accounting system? No. Doubt of non-compliance of laws. So if you look at it, see, not, su not supporting documents, regulatory authorities are sending you notices, fines and penalties are there, legal cases are going on. All these give you what? An indication that there is non-compliance of laws. Correct? So quite a simple question. Then, you have been given an assignment of audit of IT department of a PSU, okay, public sector. A checklist was handed over to you, which contains my, as many the many questions as such. So they say an our external offsite da data backups maintained at a place outside the premise. So one question is this: Are separate username and passwords assigned to individual users? Are periodically changes of password ensured? Okay, so these are all questions, and that means what are you checking? What assignment are you taking up? First of all, is it financial audit? No, we are not giving any kind of assurance here. Comprehensive audit, detailed checking is not happening. Okay, some part of it you are checking. Proprietary audit, no. So obviously it is compliance. So basically whether they have complied with the requirements or not, that is what you are checking. Okay, so it's a compliance audit. Ninth question, they are talking about Sudarshan and company was one of the joint auditors of Trilok Insurance Company. Mr. Mukesh, one of the engagement team members of the said joint auditor was examining the expenses included in the different accounts. Okay, so while uh, checking the expenses of the employees in relation to employees, this is what he came across. So Mr. Mukesh made a list of the same as follows, which he was going to discuss with the senior. Okay, so what is the list? Let us check up. Payment of salaries to employees, 95 lakh. He's put it in which account? Uh, so it is what's in which account? Employees remuneration and welfare benefits. No problem. So that's fine. You have a reimbursement of premium in the respect of employees health insurance cover. 15 lakhs, again, put in employee remuneration and welfare, no problem. Training and non-training expenses incurred for employees, they have put all together everything where employees remuneration and welfare benefits, no. Training is fine, non-training does not come in the employee's remuneration, okay? Then, 
it, it comes as other part okay then other expenses expense incurred towards medical treatment of the employees not having health cover this also is fine because welfare benefits incentive paid to employees of the company who have been solicited insurance policies incentive paid to employees it cannot be commission it will come in the employer uh, uh, remuneration and sorry employees remuneration and welfare benefit account okay so your two things are going wrong one is that non training is going to this particular thing and incentives is going to commission so both are wrong okay so let us see what is the question first whether it can be said that trilok insurance company limited have properly accounted for the expenses incurred in relation to employees the answer first is no okay so let us see which one is false correct training and non training expense incurred for employees should be bifurcated and shown separately and expense incurred toward medical treatment of the employees not having health cover should be covered into others no okay reimbursement against different so let us take the one uh, okay no non training expenses have to be shown separately and incentives paid to employees should be included in employees remuneration and welfare benefit account so answer is d here okay that we have discussed while we are reading the question itself okay then next paris bank has an npa account of messrs superis showing the recoverable amount of 35 lakhs in the books it sold the npa for 37 lakhs okay please select as to which of the following options is correct so you had 35 lakh npa okay out of which 37 lakhs you are recovering okay so what you will do this 2 lakhs excess that you have received you are going to reverse the provision so you have to say let the amount remain no credit the excess 2 lakh as profit on sale absolutely not Credit the excess of two lakh to provision for loss on sale of NP. So it has to be credit the excess. It's a reverse treatment, so you have to retain it back. All right. So the answer will be C. Then now comes to descriptive questions. Okay, it first is based on the standards and auditing. Okay. Now here you need to understand that whenever questions are given on standard, you actually have to focus on the last line properly. What exactly is the question asking you? Sometimes there are going to be so many details in the question you'll, where you'll feel so many things have been questioned. How will be able to understand it? But trust me, when you read the last line, okay, you'll be able to actually relate very easily, and you'll be able to pick up correctly and say that yes, this is a very straightforward question coming from the standard. All right. So let us have a quick reading of all of this so that you get an insight properly. Mangal and Company Chartered Accountants have been appointed as statutory auditors of Money Limited for the financial year twenty one twenty two. The audit team has completed the audit and is in the process of preparing the audit report management of the company has also prepared draft annual report okay audit in charge was going through the draft annual report and observed that the company has included an item in its annual report indicating downward trend in the market prices of the key commodities that is raw material as compared to the previous year however the actual profit margin of the company reported in the financial statement has gone in the reverse direction so basically if your raw material is coming down that means cost is coming down so profit has to increase but here they are telling even if the raw material is coming down they are showing profit to go in the reverse direction that is profit also they are showing it less audit manager discussed the issue with the partner of the firm who in reply said that the auditor are not covered with such disclosures made by the management and its annual report it being the responsibility of the management okay do you think that the partner is correct in his approach on this issue discuss with reference to the relevant standards on auditing the auditor's duty with regard to reporting okay now very simple you need to understand this is talking about annual report and when you talk about annual report simply you have to understand it is other information and obviously this is giving an indication to you directly it is talking about sa 720 auditor's responsibility with relation to other information correct so details given in the annual report is nothing but the other information so don't you think you definitely have a responsibility towards the other information also correct so because of that you have to give your what will be the auditor's responsibility with relation to the other information okay that is the information that has been appearing in the annual report so with that you have to give the reporting responsibilities with respect to sa 720 all right so you need to pick up and understand the standard correctly then cap is the auditor of master data limited of the year ended 21 22 the company requests the auditor to undertake undertake an exercise involving only verification of trade receivables okay for the half year ending 30th september 2021 the company wants to be satisfied that trade receivables are properly confirmed and reconciled okay in this regard cap has to verify the arithmetical accuracy of the trade receivables obtain confirmation and ensure verification of proper reconciliation with the confirmation he is in the dilemma as to whether he can give a report providing assurance of the company in this respect guide cap with reasoning assume the above exercise can be undertaken and there is no legal bar all right 
So here they're telling you have been appointed only for the purpose of this verification of trade receivables. Okay. So basically, this is a related service that you're providing, and it is an agreed upon procedures. Okay. So understanding here is quite simple that it is going to be a limited engagement where you can actually give up only a certificate. Okay, it is not going to be an assurance engagement because that kind of detail checking you are not doing, and it is not going to provide you a reasonable assurance, or you'll be able to give a point of assurance on it. So obviously, assurance cannot be provided. It is going to be a limited assurance. Okay, so that is based on the agreed upon procedures here. Very clearly, you have been given to check only trade receivables. Correct. So because of that, here definitely the auditor will not be able to give assurance. Okay, he'll be able to give only what limited assurance. So because it is agreed upon procedure, a related service, and because of that, a certificate can be issued regarding the verification of the trade receivables. Okay, you cannot give an assurance report on the same. And here the last part they're telling: assume that there is no legal bar. So do not start thinking about Section one forty four about the prohibited services which are given in the Companies Act, and say we cannot take up these kind of services and all that. They are telling you only think in the perspective that you have got the. Uh, Legally, you are allowed to perform this engagement, and because of which, are you allowed to give an assurance report only by checking the part of the trade receivables? Okay, so here the answer would be no. It is a limited assurance. It's an agreed upon procedure wherein you will be able to give only a certificate with respect to the verification. Assurance cannot be provided. All right, so that's a quite simple thing to be taken here. Some questions have been really, really well drafted. Okay, for this RTP, they are interesting also. So for that, your knowledge has to be uh, really conceptually very strong. Okay, moving on to the next one. Krishna Limited is a small sized 25 year old company having business of manufacturing of pipes company has plant plants based out of haridwar and have their corporate office in meerut recently the company has appointed new chartered accountant as a statutory auditor the statutory auditor want to enter into a engagement letter with the company in respect of their service but the management has contended that since the statutory audit is mandated by law engagement letter may not be required auditor did not agree obviously and has Shared a format of engagement letter with the management with reference to before getting that signed. In the respect of the management, would like to understand as per SA two one zero if the agreed terms of engagement shall be recorded in the engagement letter or other suitable form of written agreement. What should be included in the terms of agreed engagement letter? So I told you sometimes so many things will be given, but all of these things are only a story build up. Look at the last part. A very straight question. You simply have to give what will be the contents, okay, of the audit engagement letter. And here they have also given you the standard number. So as per SA two one zero, when you study about the content of the audit engagement, you know very very when you talk about the scope, when you talk about the uh, you know the coverage that you are going to have, the auditor's responsibility, the management's responsibility, the form and content of the auditor's report, correct? The applicable FRAs, all of that, correct? So basically. scope objective everything you know so all of that is going to be the content of the engagement letter a very straight forward question that you have to answer you have to write here okay with with relevance to sa 210 okay then moving on to the next one okay uh, shivrath limited has a net worth of ina 2100 crore and indas are applicable to them the company had various derivative contracts options forward contracts interest rate swaps etc which were required to be fair valued for which company got fair valuation done through an external third party now when you start reading initial part of it you get so scared in days and all of that has been questioned trust me when you continue reading it you will get a confidence that actually they are talking something that you really know the statutory auditors of the company involved an auditors expert to the audit valuation of derivatives auditor and the auditors expert were new to each other that is they were working to the first time together but developed a good bonding during the audit the auditor did not enter into any formal agreement with the auditors expert please advise now this obviously you should understand it is sa 620 using the work of auditors expert so there we study as a very very important part that you have to enter into agreement with the auditors expert so with the expert you have to enter into agreement that means be very clearly defining his scope of work nature of his work okay so uh, what is the work which are we are uh, allocating to him uh, on what we are requiring his advice also talk about the confidentiality requirements and all so basically you require to draft this kind of uh, agreement with your uh, expert which you are hiring okay so obviously it becomes extremely important especially when it is new year so understand it is very very important that you actually enter into a formal agreement taking into account all of these like scope object the kind of expertise advice that you are taking the kind of report that they'll be giving the confidentiality requirements all of this you have to take a note of in the written format so it is mandated by sa 620 okay then next one this is quite simple question and straight forward okay during the course of audit of treasure limited C. A. Gautam is concerned with the quality and effectiveness of internal control. 
towards achieving his objective he wants to assess the control environment obviously guide ca gautam with a well defined set of standard operating procedure so when you go up to this topic and see risk assessment internal control you will see uh, there is a straight question appearing on the standard operating procedure so you'll be able to get the answer quite easily okay uh, you may not be able to recollect quickly because you must have not revised it but if you have revised definitely you'll be able to pick up very quickly okay then auditors are required to obtain an understanding of internal control relevant to the audit when identifying and assessing the effectiveness of the risk of material misstatement during the audit of acharya limited you observe that significant deficiency existed in the internal control system and you want to ascertain the same elucidate the various indicators of significant deficiencies which will help you in assessing efficiency of internal control system of the organization so this is regarding again sa265 where you talk about uh, you know communicating the significant deficiencies with management tcwg so there you understand which deficiencies are considered to be significant so the question is all about that so you have to give those kind of significant ind the indicators of significant deficiencies correct so these two questions are quite straight forward not complicated so if you have the proper learning of this basically this is sa315 and this will be from sa265 if you have a proper understanding of this both these questions are quite understandable okay there will not be a difficulty then special aspects in auditing uh, this is automated environment so again they have given you all regarding the details of the background of how the business is okay basically it's an automated environment let us see the question directly ca sheetal in his audit has used a data analytical method known as the computer assisted audit technique obviously we know data analytic tool is one of the sorry one of the methods is computer assisted audit technique cat which we call give illustrations of suggested approach to get the benefit from the use of cat so approach is nothing but you need to understand the the environment the architecture then based on that have the planning properly done okay then you have to actually do the audit in a structured manner okay and that is very clearly given in the automated environment topic so you pick up you will see the approach okay of the use of cat very clearly available so again a straight forward question okay so all of these details again it's relevant only for you to understand it is automated environment they're talking about and then directly they pick the question on what cat okay those were straight answers are directly available will not have a discussion here we'll take something based on the practical uh, understanding okay now comes to company audit okay this is one of the very very uh, interesting very very important questions and i think one of the best questions of this particular rtp which is talking everything about caro okay so here the way they have picked up the question is so comprehensive that they have also asked you about applicability of caro they have also picked up on the clauses okay some of the clauses in caro so basically they have made a question which will test whether really your caro preparation is up to the mark or not okay so let us have the reading of it LIU Private Limited is a company based out of Mumbai. The company had an authorized capital of two hundred lakhs and paid up capital plus reserves of ninety five lakhs. During the audit of the year ended thirty first March, the auditor of Mrs Y N S Associates noted the following points: On fifteen December, the company has a total bank loan borrowing of seventy five lakhs. On the said date, the company received a new loan of thirty lakhs for the new project that was to be developed. However, the project was shelved. On seventeenth December, due to technical reasons, and the whole loan was paid on the same date. Okay, first of all, we need to understand what kind of company is that. It's a private limited company. Okay, and the company has authorized capital hundred lakh. Authorized capital nothing to do with because we don't talk about that there. Paid up capital, if you look, ninety five lakhs, so it is less than one crore. Okay, okay, reserves and surplus paid up capital altogether is ninety five lakhs. Obviously, it's less than the limit. Okay, so if you look at the first point, it's private limited company, and paid up capital not extending the limit. So fine, it is caro is still not applicable if you look at this. On fifteenth December, the company had a bank borrowing, so seventy-five lakhs is there. Plus, they have also taken thirty, so altogether is one not five lakhs. Now, if you look at this, the language of Caro is very clear. When you look at the applicability, you will see that when it talks about a private company, okay, it talks about uh, three important criteria. One is the total income. One they talk about is the uh, paid-up capital reserves. One they talk about the borrowings. Correct. So there, you need to understand that borrowings. When you discuss about, they take about they take the limit of any time during the financial year. So you don't take it as on thirty first of March. What is the borrowing? You take any time during the year if the borrowings have been crossing. Okay, this particular threshold. Then in that case, we say what that caro will become applicable. So is it crossing one crore any day of the year? Yes, because at one point in time it has become one zero five lakhs. Okay, so it's exceeding one crore. So definitely now for this company, caro is becoming applicable. Then. Look at the next one. During the financial year, a new proceeding was initiated against the company for holding a Benami property worth two point five crore, 
However, the company's legal team had advised that the case would not withstand the law and would be dismissed during the hearing in the April of uh, in the in April of the next financial year. Okay, so it is talking about what? Let's pick up one by one. Okay, so the easier for solving it. So it is talking about Benami property. Now tell me, because we have already decided that for private company, this private company Caro is becoming applicable because of this italic one. Now tell me when Caro is applicable, you have to refer to the para three to understand the reporting for all the twenty one clauses. So this Benami pro property, if you understand properly, it gets reported where under the clause one, it is E part. Correct. So where we talk about holding of the Benami properties, where you have to give the details of the same. Correct. So yes, reporting has to be done. Then the company has incurred a cash loss of thirty nine lakhs during the financial year compared to the cash profit fifty lakh in the previous financial year, and the total turnover of the company for the financial year is forty five cro crores. So obviously it is more than ten crores. So Caro again it is applicable here. Okay, so let us have an understanding. Previous year cash loss is there, fifteen lakhs is also there. So two years continuously there is cash losses. So reporting will happen, and obviously the clause that you pick up will be which the clause seventeen. Correct. Okay, so here you need to understand that the reporting and the clause numbers. Okay, and the understanding of which clause what will get reported. Here you see it's how important to understand. Correct. So it will be reported under clause seventeen. Further, the question is picking up on during the year the Y and S associates had offered to resign from acting as the company's auditors. However, they later decided to postpone their resignation to the following year. At the conclusion of the audit. Okay, first of all, let us take up this one regarding resignation. So if you look at the resignation, they later decided to postpone the resignation. So did they actually resign? The answer is no. And in Caro reporting, if you know it properly, you don't report if there is no resignation happening. Only if it is resignation, then obviously you are going to report about it. And that clause comes in the clause eighteen. But here nothing has been told about the same. So basically, because of they are postponing the resignation, the reporting year will not happen. Okay. Then at the conclusion of audit, there was a difference of opinion between two article assistant Jack and Jill who were assigned the engagement concerning disclosing points mentioned. in the company's auditors report as caro 2020 jack was of the opinion that the proceeding initiated under benami property act did not be disclosed since the expert legal opinion has told the same however he insisted that the cash losses shall be disclosed jill was of the opinion that caro is not applicable only hence nothing needs to be reported okay both of them approached the partners y and s to resolve the argument but both of them one is supporting jack another is supporting jill so now they come to you so you are there considering you to be the senior partner So obviously your knowledge should be at the expertise level here. So you being the senior partner now, you have to give a proper understanding. So obviously we have already discussed for this company. If you look at the threshold, yes, Caro is going to be applicable. So because of that, about the Benami property, will you report? Yes. Regarding cash losses, will you report? Yes. Resignation of the auditors because it has not happened, you are not going to report. So as a senior partner, you have to give the proper understanding of the same. Okay. So if you look at it in one question, they have tested you so well regarding so many aspects regarding Caro. All right. Okay. Then, moving on to the next one, we talk about uh, the next question that is now reporting. Okay, C A K is appointed as a statutory auditor of C K India Private Limited under the Companies Act for the first time. The company is preparing its account, considering the applicable requirements of all of this. Okay, so what have they given? The aging schedule has been given of the uh, debtors here. Okay, the proper disclosure has happened as per the requirement of the Schedule Three. Okay, here you have to see that. Uh, From MSME, we don't have dues disputed. All that is not there. But if you look at the others, less than one year is two, four, three, more than three years. Okay, so out of the entire outstanding debtors, almost eight of them, okay, they are due for more than a year. Okay, they are outstanding. So if you take this, okay, excluding that, remaining eight are outstanding for more than eight years. Okay, so aging schedule that means they are still not recoverable only, so they are not recovered, and it has been more than uh, like almost two years. Okay, the recovery period is not there. Besides about the current ratio, the debt equity ratio, okay, current ratio, debt equity, trade uh, trade payable turnover ratio, net profit ratio, disclosed in the notes to accounts have slipped drastically as compared to the last year and from the standard norms. Most of the key financial ratios are in red. Red means what? Dangerous. Okay. There is no other relevant information concerning the above notes to accounts. Then further on reviewing the bank statement for the crash credit limits. It is noticed that there is no debit transaction in the month of March. Okay, they could not repay anything. Then they are also telling that when the audit was stock audit was conducted, okay, in the report they was given the negative drawing power has come due to high creditors. Okay, according to that the banker refused to give the further uh, debits in the cash credit account. Further, upon inquiry with the management, it was identified that management did not have any major future contracts to boost their revenue and financial position. 
there is no information in this respect in the financial statement and the notes to accounts discuss how cak should deal with the above in the reporting in his audit report under the companies act 2013 so the question is so well drafted and if you look at it everything in this question is talking about something which is an indicator that the going concern assumption is going to be inappropriate there is an uncertainty which is existing a material uncertainty which is existing which is going to impact the entity's ability to continue as a going concern so if you look at the aging schedule almost most of the debtors that is out of 10 eight of them have been outstanding for more than 2 years they have not been recovered for more than 2 years they have been outstanding all the ratios are in negative all of them have slipped drastically that is also going wrong cash credits you have not used any any uh, limit which has been given to you that means there is absolutely no good business that is happening the stock audit report is also telling there is a negative cash flow there is a negative drawing power then in that case the company does not even have some kind of good projects coming up which can give you some kind of profit in the future there is no perspective also so because of that all of this is an indicator that there could be a, a material uncertainty present which is going to cast a significant doubt on the entity's ability to continue as a going concern so obviously here you are giving a reference to sa 570 but then understand properly here they are telling there is no information in respect in the financial statement and notes to accounts so in 570 what we study about the reporting if suppose there is a material uncertainty existing and about this if the management has properly disclosed properly accounted for it correctly disclosure has been given about the same in the financial statement notes to accounts then in that case obviously auditor will give a true and fair view but about that he can definitely talk about the material uncertainties uh, in the going concern paragraph which has been there but you are they telling that about these kind of situations the management has absolutely not disclosed in the financial statement and notes to account so obviously this is a very valid reason for auditor to modify his opinion correct so here the auditor looking at the situation he will definitely say there is a material uncertainty and because this would be a good reason for him to give a modified opinion so depend upon your understanding depending upon the uh, you know the assumption of the auditor or the understanding of the auditor he'll decide about the modification whether it is adverse whether it is qualified so basically when such kind of situation is there we'll end up giving an adverse opinion only all right so this is the way you are going to report and obviously modified means as per sa 705 okay then Moving on to the next one, C. A. Bharat has been appointed as the statutory auditor of Rishabh Limited for the financial year 21-22. The company, while preparing financial statements for the year under audit, has also have one additional profit and loss account that disclosed specific items of expenditure included the same as an appendix to the financial statements. C. A. Bharat has not been able to understand this as the additional profit and loss account is not covered under the applicable financial reporting framework. guide him as to how he should deal with this issue while reporting on the financial statements okay now this is very simple you need to pick up the standard correctly here if you look at this they are telling there is a particular financial statement on which there is an attachment of one additional pnl which is talking about some specific income and expenditure so basically this is what supplementary information which has been given probably the auditor here has to understand about the supplementary information which is basically not going to be an integral part of the financial statement so here as per the understanding of the standard you need to understand that the management shows it in a manner which people understand that it is properly been differentiated from the main financial statement and this information if not then the auditor is going to definitely talk about this in the other matter paragraph correct so all of this you discuss as a part of sa 700 where they have given the auditor's responsibility with regard to supplementary information correct all right then audit of consolidated financial statement this question is very simple okay they have told you about a consolidated uh, audit that you are performing that is cfs audit you are doing so here directly you can come to the last point state the procedure to be followed by ca vishwas in respect of completeness of this information okay so the question is very straight forward when you do the audit of cfs you will come across this particular question or a particular uh, study where we have where we look into previous working paper obtain the requirement from the management list of the management okay you uh, take the confirmations and everything so basically this is a question straight forward given in the material okay so how to understand whether all the components have been included in the cfs or not for this whether data is complete or not no component is omitted and all of that for that you need to ensure there is a completeness of the information provided to you so for that what is the procedure a straight question so quite easily answerable okay then audit of a very interesting question in the audit of banks okay a very beautifully drafted question bot limited is enjoying cash credit facility sanctioned from nariman point mumbai branch of knb bank for 250 crore so you are know what they are telling there is one main one main head office okay 
this particular head office is where in the nariman point mumbai and they have got a sanction of 250 crore from the knb bank okay then however for practical consideration various sub limits have been fixed for the borrower company for operation in solapur pune nasik branches of the same bank so maybe this particular company has been you know widespread and it has their branches in solapur pune nasik and all so those respective branches of knb bank has been sub limit has been given sub limit has been out of 250 they could have done like 200 is given in the main area that is mumbai then maybe out of that 10 okay must be in solapur branch then 20 will be in other and then 20 will be other okay so they have given cash rate facilities like that they have given sub limits also the manager of the solapur branch notices that there are no credit transactions in the sub limit uh, account being operated at the solapur branch for more than 90 days as on 31st march 2022 discuss the approach of ca muni statutory branch auditor of nariman point branch mumbai of knb bank in the matter of asset classification of the above borrower account also discuss the consideration for classifying the said account at the solapur branch very interesting okay this question is so here you need to understand how will you classify this are you going to classify it as a performing asset are you going to classify it as non performing asset so solapur branch when they are saying they don't have any kind of credits for the continuous period of 90 days and they are saying that they are not operating it absolutely and it has been more than 90 days now so are you going to classify it as a npa okay or will it be continue to be a performing so first of all we need to understand that in the cash credit the word that we use is going to be out of order okay so if suppose the account is out of order for a continuous period of time then in that case we say that yes we will be calling it to be an npa but now understand it becomes extremely important for us to pick up that it has to be the main branch which has to do this particular classification and whatever main branch does the classification the other branches will accept that same classification so here in the nariman point they are not telling anything regarding irregularity or they are not telling about any kind of you know out of order thing or they are not telling anything which was you know there are no transactions for 90 days and all of that so basically it is understood that it has been regular where in the main branch that is mumbai branch okay so because it is like that okay understand it is not be termed as out of order because there it is happening regularly so when the nariman point branch is not calling it to be out of order that means they have classified it to be what performing asset so whatever classification has been given by the main branch the same classification will be taken by all the sub branches also that will all the branches also so whatever is the nariman points classification the same classification will be adopted by solapur pune nasik it is going to be borrower wise okay so if the main branch is going to keep it as a performing asset all of them will keep it performing if it keeps at non performing all of them also will keep it non performing all right so it will be the proper decision taken by whom the main branch which has extended the credit facility okay the sub limits and all is only for the operational requirement it is not not for different classification so the classification will definitely happen only with respect to the main branch all right so all of this information is irrelevant okay that no credit has happened in the solapur branch and all no it will purely be dependent upon what is the main branch giving it a classification okay then Uh, audit of fiscal law this is quite simple it is talking about uh, obviously tax audit okay here they are talking about the duty drawback and also it is about uh, duty drawback as not been credited to statement of pnl so here definitely as per the from uh, 3 cd you are going to report as per 16b the clause 16b so a very simple question not a help required absolutely so if you have finished the studying of the clauses okay the tax audit then in that case the reporting there will be able to pick up very easily about the duty drawback requirements okay the clause 16b talks about it now psu here the question have been very uh, simple okay so here they say that uh, there has been a company which was wholly owned by central government so 100% stake is of central government but some part of it is got disinvested during the year <coughs> because of which the 40% has gone to the public so even then how much is held by the state, central government 60% now you know what is the government company definition government company we say not less than 51% of the paid up capital is held either by central state or jointly by central or state government correct now here even if 40% is held by the public still 60% comes under whom the government so don't you think this particular company siddha limited still continues to be a government company yes now look at the last point here they say that mahavir the fm the finance manager of the company is of the opinion that now the company is subject to stringent control by bsc here they are telling the company is got listed on bsc okay now and the markets therefore the auditing requirements of the limited company in the private sector and the companies at 2013 would be applicable to the company and cag will not play any role understand 60% is still with whom central government so siddha limited is still what government company and if it is the government company entire audit requirements come under whom cag so the contention of fm here is absolutely wrong 
So this was very simple question. Okay. Then next one, 22. Okay, so here they're talking about CA Sanjana is acting as a credit manager in branch of DFC Bank Limited. The company has approached the branch for a request to sanction credit facility worth 10 crore for meeting usual business requirement. Okay, indeed, it's a prospective new client. She checks past history of the company, background of the promoter, director, shareholding pattern, nature of business, assessment of the financial result of the past year, future projections. Also carries out SWOT analysis. Okay, after reading all this, you'll be able to understand easily what she is doing. Besides assessment of net worth of directors also undertaken, status of civil score and uh, position of the name of promoters, directors in the RBI defaulter list is also verified. She also makes a discreet inquiry from new uh, clients of the branch engaged in the similar line of activity regarding credit worthiness of the company, its promoters and directors. Okay, now they're telling... Based on the above, identify the activity being performed by CA Sanjana. Undoubtedly, what she's doing? Due diligence she's performing. Correct? Her activity is completely what? A due diligence requirement. Okay? And you give the definition of due diligence. What is the meaning of due diligence that you have to explain? Would your answer be different if this activity was to be performed by a person not qualified as chartered accountant? You already know that due diligence not required to be a mandatory chartered accountant. It can be conducted by any other professional also. Okay? So can a non-CA perform the activity? Obviously, yes. Okay. See, here the thing is, no, if they give due diligence as a heading and all, obviously you'll start thinking quite clearly. Okay. But then suppose in the exam, all of a sudden such kind of question is drafted, which I call it to be very interesting question. Okay. Something out of the box. So this kind of question, when it comes, you should be able to pick up with conceptual clarity that what is CS Anjana actually doing here. Okay. Then you'll be able, if you're able to say due diligence, that means there is a clarity. Very well, you have understood it. Okay. Then. Name any other three areas where identified activities can be undertaken. Identified activities are in the question due diligence. So where other places where due diligence activities can be taken up? It could be takeovers. Okay. It could be uh, IPOs. Okay. It could be corporate restructuring. Okay. Venture capital finance decisions. Okay. All of these areas also you can go in for uh, due diligence. Okay. All the activities will be taken up. Then come to peer review and quality review. Now peer review, there have been a lot of amendments. Okay. Which you have to actually go through properly. And quality review, there is no amendment absolutely. So let us see what the question is. Secretarial staff is of the qual of the quality review board. So the question is on the quality review. Is in the process of preparing a panel for submission to the board to enable it to initiate reviews of the quality of the audit service provided by members of ICEI. The draft panel has been prepared by Mr. P, a junior staff in the QRB secretariat. And it has moved up in the hierarchy for vetting by a senior staff, Mr. R, before putting up... Okay, all this is extra details given to you. So what have they given? The draft panel contains the following. So name of the entity. They are all the entities picked up for quality review. So you have uh, these companies. They are whether they are listed or unlisted. Which sector are they operating? What is their paid up capital, annual turnover, outstanding loan, name of the audit firm? Okay, that means these audit firms have conducted the audit year. Figures are of the immediately preceding financial year are in crores. crores okay. Is this conclusion of the names of audit firm of the corresponding entities in the draft panel to be put before QRB appropriate guide Mr. R? Now you need to pick up here very carefully. See, understand earlier it was only ICAI which was having complete control over the quality review. Okay, this entire peer review quality review was completely under the under ICAI. But now because of the establishment of NFRA, okay, there are certain categories of companies, okay, which directly fall under the purview of NFRA, which you study as the part of section 132. The rule three talks about it, correct? So basically you need to see out of these, which companies come under the purview of NFRA. If they come under that, then obviously it should be by the recommendation of NFRA, whether the review has to be conducted and based on that, the reviewers will be appointed. Okay, if they don't come under this particular rule, then obviously it will be done by whom? Directly taken up by the recommendation of ICAI. So here, let us see. First of all, uh, if you look at the rule three requirements, you need to require and remember the thresholds properly. Okay, let us see directly here. XYZ limited, unlisted, okay, fine. Education is not covered, paid up, fine. Okay, annual turnover is crossing 1,000 crore. Okay, so obviously it comes under what? NFRA. Then, PQR limited is listed, listed undoubtedly NFRA. Then, X insurance limited, depending upon the nature also, we have studied, it comes under NFRA. Then, AAZ limited, it is unlisted, manufacturing, Okay, all these are below the threshold. So basically, this can be directly picked up by what? The panel, ICA can directly review it. Okay, the quality review. So basically, here, uh, the entire panel which has been chosen cannot be appropriate. So here we can say the last one is acceptable, but the first three will be on the recommendations of NFRA. 
all right okay then let us take up the last one that is regarding the professional ethics mr s is a practicing chartered accountant based out of chennai during the weekend he involved himself in the equity research and used to advise his friends relatives and other people who are known who are not his clients okay apart from this he was also involved in paper setting for accounting subject in school in which he studied he also owned agricultural land and was doing agricultural during his free time during the year 2021 heavy losses were incurred in the agricultural activity due to natural calamity and the misfortune and he lost almost all of his wealth and became undischarged insolvent after a few court hearings finally in 2023 he was dis declared discharged insolvent and obtained certificate from the court stating his insolvency was caused by misfortune without any misconduct on his part you are required to comment on the above situation with reference to the chartered accountants act 1949 and the schedules there too especially from the point of view of section 8 entry of name of the register now very interesting question here they have asked you so many things together first of all see uh, you need to understand the decisions of the ethical standard board and that is the reason when you do professional ethics we focus and say that yes the decisions the recent decisions taken by the ethical standard board you have to take up because questions can actually come up there we have understood very clearly that you cannot publish any kind of report you cannot publish any kind of data regarding all these kind of services equity research and all a uh, publicly making any report available or giving any kind of data you know um, a kind of report cannot be prepared and published by you that is not allowed but definitely can you engage yourself in equity research yes can you advise your friends yes those are not your clients can you suggest them that is not a problem absolutely so here there is nothing called as guilty of professional misconduct that is absolutely allowed and that is given by the ethical standard board decision okay so can you set paper setting can you do yes so clause 11 of the part 1 of the first schedule okay when you talk about it there are some kind of general permissions granted to the chartered accountants and one of them is about the paper setting so general permission has been given then you talk about heavy losses incurred in agriculture first of all agriculture activity can you take yes for that also you have a general permission absolutely allowed now you are very important regarding you being declared as insolvent okay now obviously we have to study about disability of a member you will understand that when a member is declared as insolvent okay then obviously his name will be removed from the register of member and he will not be able to continue the membership but then if he is undischarged okay in, that means if he is discharged insolvent if the court declares him to be insolvent and along uh, declares him to be uh, no longer insolvent that means he is uh, discharged in that case what happens is it is very important that the court should also give a certificate that the entire insolvency or the reason for his insolvency was purely his misfortune so here obviously they are telling that though he was he became undischarged insolvent even after that also after few court hearings he has got what a declaration that he has obtained a certificate from the court stating that his insolvency was caused by misfortune now because both the conditions have been satisfied that he has been declared discharged insolvent along with that he has also got this certificate so in that case do you think he'll be allowed to have his name entered in the register of members again the answer is yes okay so his name will be brought back in the register of members so if you look at it the first point is telling that he is allowed there is no problem absolutely second general permission granted fourth also general permission granted to carry on agricultural activity then your disability will be if you are declared as insolvent okay and even if you are uh, you know declared as insolvent in that case if suppose a certificate comes that the only reason was for the misfortune okay because of your destiny you have got that then in that case also your name will not be removed correct so this is the entire discussion that you have with regard to the professional ethics okay so here they are saying he was declared discharged insolvent and obtained a certificate of sitting okay so only you discharge as insolvent doesn't matter only also the certificate becomes very important okay okay write a short note of this week you don't have to discuss very much in detail so categorization of nbfc again an amendment part so when you go through the amendment uh, lecture you'll be able to get the understanding of this very easily okay where you have the base level layer the middle layer top layer and all then you have role of risk management committee this you have to pick up from the rtp november 22 okay important discussion that time because it was taken as a part of amendment there then qualities of the operational auditor this is state questions okay so if you look at the suggested answers there are few answers which i really want you to go through so these are the easy ones that we picked up 720 we picked up correctly then we also understood regarding uh, see related service there are agreed upon procedures correct so on that you really cannot provide assurance they are not attestation services okay so you cannot give a report providing assurance for such service you can only issue a factual report correct then sa 210 obviously what are the contents this we have discussed in detail 620 what are the things that you write in the uh, report of expert and the auditor 
Then standard operating procedures are quite uh, easy, straight question it is. Then 265, communicating the deficiency in internal control. Okay, here you have to understand what are significant deficiencies by understanding the control environment. So this also you have to have a good reading of it. Okay, then uh, data analytics. Okay, CAT. Okay, again a straight question. Uh, if you look at the answer given in suggested answers for Caro, I think all this is too much uh, detail given, not required to be given so much in the exam as a part of answer. When the question is speaking strictly about private companies, you give the uh, answer only about thresholds of the private companies. So you can see here 1 crore, 1 crore, 10 crore, all these limits have been given. So based on that, we have taken up the answer. Okay, so here we have clearly understood regarding Caro requirement, whether applicable or not, the answer is yes, Caro will be applicable. Okay, then... Uh, Benami property, obviously, I told you, you have to report as per the clause 1, E, okay? Then 17, Caro, yes. 18, don't have to report. Okay, so here they're telling there's no reporting requirement for resignation. Correct? Then, all this going concern. So, you can see, we ended up the answer correctly saying that, first of all, we gave 570 reference going concern, correct? You also spoke about 705 modification to be done. Then supplementary information, that is SA 700, talks about it very much in detail. Consolidation is a very straightforward question. Okay, it's a straight question available in the uh, study material. You can pick up very easily. Okay, regarding NPI, I told you that what is given about Sulapur branch, you consider it to be immaterial. So hence, uh, Muni should consider assets classification considering total position of operation of all the accounts for the concerned branches. Okay, so what has been adopted by the main branch that only will be considered for all the branches. And obviously, main branch will take into account all the operations, taking into account everything. Then 16B of 3CD, that is quite uh, understandable how the reporting has to be done. Then 245 talks about government company. So you explain government company. And yes, it is a government company because 60% is still held. So CAG only will be responsible. Then due diligence, we spoke very clearly. And where else you can use due diligence? Corporate restructuring, venture capital, public offering, all of that. Correct? Then NAFRA. Okay, so this you have to give first all the limits of NAFRA. And then you, based on that, you have to tell which will be on the recommendation of NAFRA and which will be directly by ICAI. So that we have taken up very quickly here. Last year, we say about uh, professional ethics. Here they're talking about he can involve himself in equity research, no problem. He can also advise his friends, relatives and other knowledgeable person. What he cannot do is he cannot publish a paper on the same. Correct? Then, uh, permission granted generally, that is clause 11 of the part one of the first schedule, correctly answered. Then when you talk about section eight, here they say very clearly, Section 8, they say, has not obtained from the court a certificate stating that his insolvency was caused by misfortune without any misconduct on his part. Okay. Here it may be noted that person who has been removed from membership for a specified period shall not be entitled to have his name entered in the register under the expiry of the period. That is study as a part of Section 8. Okay. When his name has to be entered and not entered. So I think that's it. And these are the direct classifications, risk management committee. And finally, we have qualities of operational audit. Okay, so this was the total discussion that we had with regard to all the MCQ discussion, the case study based MCQs and descriptive questions. Okay, so if you look at the proper understanding of the uh, discussion that we have had, uh, basically the question descriptive questions, most of the places there have been direct questions, straight questions have been there, though they have complicated by inserting a lot of scenarios and all, but at the end the questions have been very, very simple. So I believe if your preparation has been really up to the mark and even there is time now where you can actually revise very well. Since it is a theory paper, there is some parts of it which you re really will forget if you don't revise regularly. And this RTP will give you a proper understanding which parts you're able to remember very easily, which you are not. Okay. So with this, I think it will be a good coverage for you of your understanding of, uh, you know, your level of preparation, where exactly you are standing. And this RTP will also give you an exposure to every way in which you are required to give the answers to the examination question. All right. So this is the discussion that we had for the RTP. So wishing you all the very best. Please do prepare really well for the upcoming examination. All right. So this is the complete discussion of RTP. Thank you.